So it seems yeah. like a good idea, especially following uh, the last couple of weeks, we talked about the Lord's Prayer. And um, it seemed like a good idea to follow up with some more lessons, talks, discussions on prayer. And yeah. so we are going to um, look at, uh, Jesus says, my house shall be a house of prayer, shall be called a house of prayer. And uh, we'll, we'll spend some time with that tonight. And, and it's not a particularly long lesson. We might get through it pretty easily in about 20 or 30 minutes. So anyway, Susie, you were first here. So will you pray this first prayer? My house shall be a house of prayer. Prayer based on Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. Father, we pray that you would impart to us the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know you through our deepening intimacy with you. We pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of our imagination, flooding us with light until we experience the full revelation of the hope of your calling. That is the wealth of your glorious inheritances that you find in us, your holy ones. I pray that we will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of your power made available to us through faith. Amen. And we say, yes, Lord. And Cindy, can you pray this prayer based on Jeremiah 33, 3? Father, we call on you in Jesus' name, asking that you would show us great and mighty things which we do not know. Amen. So that's a promise of, of God to Jeremiah. Call on me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things, things you did not know. God wants us to know and he wants us to understand, right? So Holy Spirit, we welcome you today as our helper and our teacher. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for opening up your word to us that we may understand you more and better walk in your ways. And Mary Lou, can you read Isaiah 56, 7 through 1 Corinthians 6, 19? Okay. God's house. Isaiah 56, 7. <clears throat> I will bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. 48. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me? He said, he said the Lord, or where will my place of repose be? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Thank you. So under the Old Testament, <laughs> what are you doing, Vicky? Under the Old Testament, God's presence dwelt in the temple in the most holy place, which is also called the Holy of Holies. This was a temporary arrangement. For how can the creator of heaven and earth be confined to a small space? Because of Israel's idolatry and bloodshed somewhere around 400 years before Christ and before the Babylonian exile, God's presence left the temple and left Israel. So there was that stretch of four or 500 years that uh, God's presence was not with Israel. Now in the new covenant, God doesn't live in a man-made house, but he lives in each one of his people. We now tend to gather in a building which is commonly called the house of the Lord. <clears throat> but of course he doesn't live there because he lives in you and I. But when we are there, he is there. So in a loose sense, you can call a church the Lord's house. 
The other sense it could be called the Lord's house is when it is set apart unto him for his purposes, but not as his dwelling place, right? It says this is the Lord's house. Well, it's his house, not because he lives there, but because it's been consecrated and sanctified unto him, right? So I was, I was re, as I was putting this together, and I was thinking about this, so all these years, it's uh, 400 and some years that Israel was, <clears throat> the priesthood was going through their motions and and all that that uh that's all they were doing was going through the motions because god presence god's presence was not there it was not the same thing and i think that's what happens with a lot of churches is as the ministry has grieved the lord to the point that he says i'm done here in a sense and the presence of the Lord, in a sense, a uh, very real sense, backs off. And the people just go through the motions of playing church. But they don't, they don't have any, anything, any movement of the Holy Spirit in there, right? So where is God's house? It's, uh, well, I'm his house, so. Okay. As long where as you accept house? Christ, he is in you. His house is wherever the Christian is. That's right. His house. Ooh. Are you boring yourself? His house individually, <laughs> where we are at, shall be called a house of prayer. And his house corporately, where we gather, shall be called a house of prayer. Wherever we are, and whenever we are there, we should maintain an attitude of prayer. Right, where the house of prayer, each person and the corporate body of Christ is, is the is to be called the house of prayer. So we should maintain an attitude of prayer. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, doesn't it? And everything gives thanks. Pray without ceasing. I'm not implying that we don't pray because we do all pray. I am saying that if we really want what God has for us then prayer is going to come more and more to the forefront of our personal lives as well as corporately. Um, Todd, can you go ahead and read Martin Luther here? Too busy to pray. Too busy to pray. Martin Luther is quoted as saying, I have so much to do, I must spend the first three hours of the day in prayer. Smith Wiggleworth, when asked about his prayer life, said he never prayed for more than 20 minutes, but never went longer than 20 minutes without praying. Go ahead and read the next paragraph. Martin Luther was principal in kicking off the Protestant Reformation and starting a journey out from the very some very dark days of the church. He was certainly not perfect, but may have done more for the church than anyone else in the last 500 years. Smith Wiggleworth lived a life of the miraculous everywhere he went, and there was no devil or sickness or deformity that was able to stand against his faith, that it was God's will that all be healed. Amen. So do you ever, anybody ever feel like you don't have time to pray? Yep. Yep. Sometimes we just seem to get that attitude. Oh, I, well, I, have to I wanted to pray this afternoon, story. but I didn't get a chance. I have to tell you a story of uh, uh, Anthony Womack. Womack said that he had a discipline years and years and years ago that at seven o'clock, I don't know if it was in the morning or in the evening, he would pray, and and uh, it was for more than an hour. I think it was a couple of hours. So it must have been in the morning. I don't know, but uh, one day, you know, he just he just dreaded it, you know, because he'd go to this spot and he'd get on his knees and he he'd be praying, and he's just miserable the whole two hours. And so one day he said to the Lord about quarter to seven, he says, you know, about 15 minutes before it's time for me to come and pray, I just dread it. And the Lord says, yeah, I know. I start dreading it at 630. <laughs> and so what, Anth what uh, Andrew was saying is that uh, we need to get into a um, 
fellowship, a uh, communion with the Lord where we're just talking with him all day long, like our best friend, you know? It's like if you hang out, you know, women, they don't have any trouble talking. Keith hang out, hung out with Alan the other day for several hours, and I think they talked most of the time, except for 20 minutes when he got a call from his niece. And, uh, you know, that's how, how it can be with the Lord. It's like it's not a duty. It's like, okay, now, okay, it's time, time to pray and make it like a religious duty. But it should be something where... Uh, we're praying without ceasing where we're constantly talking to God. I talk to him all day long. I lose something. I ask him to help me find it. Uh, some problem comes up. I start praying over that person in that situation. You know, it's, it's like, he's my helper, you know, he's my helper. And so um, I, I really love my connection with him. I love feeling the companionship with him. You know, you never are lonely when you, when God is always with you, you know? And um, so I think that's the house of prayer. I think it's continual. Wasn't it Smith Wigglesworth that never would wear a hat? Cause I think back in those days, you're supposed to take your hat off in respect when you prayed. So he was always in prayer. So he just never wore a hat even though it wasn't uh, acceptable. It was scandalous for a man to not run around with a hat on his head or to run around without a hat. Yeah. But he but, did it out of honor, honoring the Lord. Because he was always in communion with the Lord. Okay. Angel, would you like to read? Did we lose Angel? Yes. Oh, there you are. My house shall be called. We read those three verses in Isaiah. Isaiah 56, 5, I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Isaiah 56, 6, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servant, all who keep the Sabbath without profaning it and who hold fast to my covenant. Verse seven, I will bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. The burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted in my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Amen. Thank you. So who is Isaiah speaking of? The Lord speaking. The Lord speaking about those who worship him. Right. He's speaking of all those who join themselves to him, isn't he? He's speaking of those who come to him in faith. Whether they're the Jews that are coming to him or the Gentiles that are joining themselves to the Lord, right? And then, of course, the Lord's house now is the body of Christ. Enter Jesus. Grady, can you read these three verses? Jeremiah 7, 11. As this house which bears my name, become a den of robbers in your sight. Yes, I too have seen it, declares the Lord. Matthew 21, 12. Then Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those selling doves. 21, 13. And he declared to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Amen. So Jesus is quoting portions of Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah here. The merchants back then, in cooperation with the priests, you guys have probably all heard this, but perhaps not. The merchants in cooperation with the priests 
would force the people to buy suitable sacrifices from them by rejecting the sacrifices the people had brought. In this way, they were stealing from the people and thereby making the temple a den of thieves. Jesus saw right through their corrupt nonsense and chased them out. God has no tolerance for corruption in the ministry. Sometimes it may go on for a while, but eventually, if not repented of, the consequences will be severe. God does not tolerate, um, especially those in the ministry, especially those who are, who, who are serving him, between him and the people, and that are actually corrupt and stealing from the people. That is not a good place to be. It's not a good place for a pastor or prophet, anybody else to be taken advantage of the people by fleecing them or any other means of taking advantage of them. It's just all wrong. Very, very wrong. I looked for an intercessor. Joanna, could you read that uh, out of Ezekiel? No. See that? That green thing isn't going across. Pardon? The green thing, it's not wide enough. Okay. Are you there, Joanna? Oh, maybe, maybe Joanna stepped away. I don't know what Vic's got going on with her computer there. It's messing with me. Oh, anyway. Well, let's go back up to, um, I was going to have Vicky read. Um, yeah, I noticed that green, that green screen, it could be wider if, if to cover both of you, or, or the camera could be adjusted to have a narrower field of view right. and just be uh, taken in Vicky. And then you can move the green screen over behind her. So. Right. Well, I think if we turn it 90 degrees and and uh, I can work it out where we can make it wider so it'll cover us better. It's pretty narrow one way and pretty wide the other way. It must be seven feet one way and five feet the other way. So anyway, maybe, maybe only four feet. Anyway, I looked for an intercessor. Vicki, can you read those three verses? Well, not yet. You'll have to read it. I'm going to ask Susie to read it. Ezekiel 22, 29. The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have exploded the foreign residents without justice. 22, 30. I searched for a man among them to repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. 2231, so I poured out my indignation upon them and consumed them with the fire of my fury. I have brought their ways down upon their own heads, declares the Lord of God. Amen. But God isn't happy to do that, is he? Ezekiel 33, 11 says, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should return, turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? So God's heart is compassion and mercy. God would rather show mercy. The Bible says that mercy triumphs over judgment. Right. In fact, James 2.13 here. Cindy, can you read that? For judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There was supposed to be a space between those. Anyway, yes. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God's heart is never to drop the hammer on anybody. His heart is never to ruin anybody's life or livelihood. But if people don't repent, then the consequences will come. Seed time and harvest consequences will will come if you if you uh, 
Anyway, I don't need to keep on saying that. <laughs> Prayer for saints <laughs> and for message. Let's have Vicki read the two verses in Ephesians. Okay. Ephesians 6, 18 and 19. Pray in the spirit at all times with every kind of prayer and petition. To this end, stay alert with all perseverance in your prayers for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will boldly make known the mystery of the gospel. Amen. And confidence before God. Mary Lou, can you read those two verses in First John? First uh, John five fourteen, and this is a confidence that we have before Him if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And fifteen, and we know that He hears us in whatever we ask. We know we already possess what we have asked of Him. Amen. So. In Christ, we have everything, right? In God, we have everything. There is, we're in God, we're in Christ. And um, he has everything. In fact, Paul says everything is ours. And so this is interesting when you read verse 15 here. We know that we already possess what we have asked of him. It's already ours. And that's a mindset that we need to, that's a mindset and an understanding that, that we need to grasp that God is not holding out. He's not waiting for us to be miserable enough to, uh, you know, we already, he, we already possess what we have asked of him. It's already ours. It's already ours. Right. And amen. You know, and that's a that's a powerful powerful understanding. And um, verse fourteen: If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. How do we know the will of God? By what the Word says. By what Jesus did. And God's will will never be inconsistent with the Word of God. And will never be inconsistent with what Jesus did. All right, Jesus healed the sick, cast out devils. God's will is always to heal the sick and set the captive free. We never have to wonder if it's ever God's will that somebody be sick. All right, it's never God's will that they be sick because His will is clearly revealed in His Word and in what Jesus did. Persistence pays off. Whose turn is it? It must be Todd's turn to read. Go ahead and read these verses in uh, Luke, Todd. Luke 18, 1, 2, and 3. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray at all times and not lose heart. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected no respected men. And there was a widow in that town who kept appealing to him, give me judgment against my adversary. Okay, go ahead and continue. 8, 14, 8, Luke 18, 4. For a while he refused, but later said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect men, Verse 5, yet because this widow keeps persisting me, I will give her justice. Then she will stop wearing me out with her perpetual requests. Verse 6, and the Lord said, listen to the words of the unjust judge. Verse 7, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him days, day and night? Will he continue to defer their help? Verse 8, I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice on their behalf. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will find, will he find faith on earth? Okay, so let's look at that last little bit there. Will he find faith on earth? Why did Jesus say that? Anybody want to 
want to venture a, something on that? I do. Because you got to hold God to his promises. If he says that he's going to do something for you, then you be persistent and say, God, you said, you said. And he loves that. He loves for us to remind him what he's promised us and to insist that he fulfills that promise. He says, that's faith. So that's why Jesus, Jesus had just told this story, right? About persistence, about refusing to let go of the, of the promise, refusing to let go of what they needed. And Jesus says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will we find faith on the earth? In other words, there is a possibility, even likelihood, that when Jesus returns, that there will be his people that will not persist in prayer. They will pray, and they didn't get the answer, and so they give up. They say, well, I prayed for a week, and nothing happened. I guess it's just not God's will that I be healed, or it's just not God's will that my my daughter be set free from the from the drug addiction no it is god's will for the healing and it is god's will for the drug addict addict to be set free but sometimes we need to persist in prayer and, and refuse to back off in the name of jesus right um angel can you read james five sixteen b the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, believer, can accomplish much when you put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. Amen. So that's out of the Amplified Bible. I should have put a footnote there. I should have put amp right there because anyway, um, the heartfelt and persistent prayer that means it means something to us right the heartfelt this really means this is important to me this is important to me really really important to me and persistent i'm not going to let go of it the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man a believer can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by god that prayer is dynamic and can and have tremendous up. power or other translations will say really or I think a, a different variation of the amp will say uh, will release tremendous power dynamic in its worth in its working. So prayer must be persistent and it must be consistent. <clears throat> we need to know what we're praying for and who we're praying for. We need to know that it's God's will that the lost are saved and the sick are healed and the demonized set free and the hungry fed. And then refuse to give up. Far too often, someone will pray, and since the answer doesn't come, wasn't instant, they give up and decide it wasn't for them. And that's really, you know, that's that's uh, that's sad, right? It's just sad when people give up. It's like I just I just got to have this, but they're they're uh, got to have. Go, they go from this got to have this to well, I'll live without it. Um, and, and about, uh, two shakes of a lamb's tail sometimes it doesn't, they just don't stick with it. And so that's what really why Jesus is saying, will he find faith on earth? Well, will the son of mine find, find faith on earth when he returns? So we really need to stick to it and stick to it and stick to it. Mercy triumphs. Grady, can you read that? God's desires. Mercy over judgment and desires the sick to be healed and captives set free and brokenhearted restored. God desires the saints to be encouraged and God desires the message of the gospel to be preached to all nations. God has made us to be co-laborers with him in Christ. God's will is not going to be done without our involvement. Life and death are in the power of our time. Amen. So if we don't open our mouths and pray, 
right? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. If we don't open our mouths and pray and intercede, then people aren't going to have what they need and people are going to die early and, and all that, right? So anyway, attitude. Is Joanna still gone? Maybe so. No, she's on. Joanne? Joanna, are you on there? Oh, you know what? If, if, if it's okay, I'm just I'm just gonna listen to you guys. Okay. Okay, That's great, nice. honey. Um Vicky, will you read attitude? Attitude, first Thessalonians 5, 16 through 21. Rejoice at all times, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in every circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not extinguish the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Amen. So we all want signs and wonders. We want to see the sick healed and the lost saved and the demonized set free. This is all the supernatural byproduct of being a house of prayer individually and corporately. Okay, that's a wrap, and I'm going to ask Susie, can you read this uh, last prayer, pray this last prayer for all of us? Hey John 1, 2. Dear friends, I pray you may prosper concerning everything and be healthy just as your soul prospers. Thank you, Susie. Amen. God is a good God, and... I will stop sharing. Stop the